Hello and welcome. I'm standing here in front of the poet. The poet is a piece of art created by Pu Tian Shen in 2009. It's modeled after the Chinese writer Lu Xun. As you can see, not even writers or statues are immune to COVID-19. Now, my name is Torbjörn Nordling, and I'm an assistant professor in automatic control at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the National Shengong University in Taiwan. I'm also the general chair of this workshop and have the great pleasure of introducing our honorary chair, Chair Professor Wu, that will give his welcome address. Welcome. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of the National Chen Kang University in Taiwan. I am proud that our team, the NCKU Parkinson's Disease Quantifiers, are one of the finalists in the OpenCV AI competition. They are also arranging this workshop. Now let us all learn computer vision and AI using the OD camera together. Hello and welcome. I am Akram Ashiani, postdoc researcher at the Department of Mechanical Engineering of National Chen Kong University in Taiwan and assisting chair of this workshop. I would like to start by thanking you for registering and attending this workshop. It is a pleasure to serve you and the more than 1,000 other registered participants. When you like this content, please do not hesitate to let us know. You are also welcome to subscribe to our channel on YouTube and Twitch and press the alarm button if you wish to be notified about future videos from us. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Torbjörn Nordling, who is an assistant professor in automatic control at the Department of Mechanical Engineering and joint faculty at the Min Wu School of Computing at the National Chen Kong University. He is also a senior lecturer in media technology at the Department of Applied Physics and Electronics at the Umo University in Sweden and principal investigator at the Nordeling Lab. Professor Nordeling has previously co-founded several companies and currently acts as an angel investigator and advisor to multiple startups such as Darmian in the United States and virtual internship in the United Kingdom. He will give a presentation on the project that has founded my postdoc the past two years, titled Computer Vision Based Assessment of Motor Skills, a step towards digitalization of the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale. Please enjoy it. Thank you for attending this lecture today. It's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to speak of the work that we are doing in my lab together with my collaborators. Let me now switch to my slides. My talk today is titled Computer Vision Based Assessment of Motor Skills, a step towards digitalization of the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale. In it, I will be covering background and vision, literature review, experiment setup, demo videos, data collection, preliminary results, challenges, and the roadmap forward. So let me start with the background and vision. So this is work that has been funded by the Ministry of Science and Technology in Taiwan, which I would like to thank. It was funded under the title Application of Micromotion Analysis to Improve Care of Parkinson's Disease Patients with my co-PIs, Assistant Professor Tan from Kaohsiung Medical University and Associate Professor Lin from National Shengong University. In this project, 
we have been collaborating together with Dr. Chen and Dr. Li. And I would like to thank these four collaborators for joining this project so that we together can make a difference for, pa for patients suffering from Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is the second most common form of neurodegenerative disease after Alzheimer's disease. It is affecting approximately 1% of the population above 60 years old with increasing prevalence. And the population is also aging, which makes it a disease that we need to make progress on because sadly today no cure exists. However, assessment of the motor function is needed to prescribe treatment and evaluate clinical trials. Now, medication that can reduce the symptoms exist and needs to be dosed properly. And therefore we need precise assessment of the motor function. Now, currently the assessment is done by the physician watching and scoring movement tests in accordance with the Movement Disorder Society sponsored revision of the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, MDS UPDRS for short. Now, this scoring is done on a scale from zero to four meaning that the scoring is coarse. Now, it also happens to be subjective, time-consuming and expensive due to that. Now, my vision is to contribute to the next revision of UPDRS to use computer vision and AI to automate and digitalize the assessment. Now, as a step towards this goal, we have been focusing on the motor examination part of UPDRS and selected seven tests that we record data for. These tests are finger tapping, hand movement, postural and rest tremor for the hands and then we have leg agility, toe tapping and rest tremor for the legs. Literature review. So Post at all in 2005 demonstrated the subjectivity of the rating by applying the current MDS UPDRS scale. This is here shown in terms of pairwise differences between raters against their mean for the total UPDRS motor exam part. What we can see uh, is that depending on which people that have been paired, we have very different variation and correlation between them. Ferraris et al. has published a number of works related to assessment of UPDRS tests using computer vision methods. One of the more interesting ones is their self-managed system that they published in 2018. Here you can see an illustration of how they have created a glove with colored fingers in order to make it easier to identify the fingers using computer vision methods. The first figure here demonstrates finger tapping, then we have hand movement, and then we have pronation supination movements. And down here you can see the distance between the thumb 
and the index finger recorded by three different systems. So there, human computer interface, and then we have the Intel RealSense, the blue line, and then we have an optical electronic reference system, which is the black line. And we can clearly see that we have some deviations between these three systems. Now, here in particular, marked in with P1, we have a very large difference in the results from the Intel RealSense system. And that is because it wrongly identifies the middle finger as the index finger. And then a little bit later here, marked by P3, then we can see that it again identifies the index finger correctly, as we can see in this figure up here. Here by P2 is a case where the true maximum amplitude is missed. So what this illustrates is that this system is still far from perfect and that even when a special glove with markers is being used, the computer vision doesn't work perfectly. Another of their works has considered estimation of the angular measures during leg agility test, a racing from a chair and posture based on recording using a kinetic device. In 2019, they were putting together both the upper and lower limb subsystems and published it under the name Albania et al. What we can see here is that we have the computer that is being used to record all the hand movements with the gloves with the markers on it. And here we have a person using the glove. Then for the lower limbs, they are using sensors that are being placed one on each leg and then also one on the chest. And then they have constructed a graphical user interface uh, for the test subject to be able to decide which test to do. Now, obviously, a color calibration is also being needed for the glove to work since they have a graphical user interface for that too. Now, it's very interesting to look at the classification accuracies for healthy controls versus PD. Then we can see that for finger tapping, they achieve an accuracy of 98%. For the hand movement, 92%. For the uh, pronation, supination movement, 99% almost. For the leg agility, 93% almost. And for the sit to stand movement, we have 91.5%. And then for the gait, 93%. Now, this is binary classification. So healthy controls versus subjects with Parkinson's disease. Then if we instead look at their accuracies when they distinguish between the different levels of Parkinson's disease. In other words, the scores from zero to four. And this last line shows it using a consensus score by three different raters. Then we can see that the finger tapping only has an accuracy of 79 only 70% for the hand movement, 67% for pronation supination, and 
71% for leg agility and 64% for sit to stand and 61% for gait which means uh, that the system does not achieve the same score as the human raters now considering that this is a consensus score it's likely that the human raters actually are correct and the system makes errors now we also have the parkinson's analysis with remote kinetic tasks abbreviated park framework by langevin et al in 2019 now their vision is that uh, an individual with parkinson's disease just would open his laptop go to their website and then follow uh, demonstration videos that provide instructions and then repeat the same movement in front of the laptop's camera which is then automatically assessed and scored by the system now here in the lower row uh, we can see that uh, the system clearly recognizes the hand first but then when another person walks in the background it thinks that this person is the hand and then here we have another error that they have documented it first recognizes the hand but then the person makes a small adjustment to the web camera and then it fails to recognize Then we also have the cloud UPDRS by Stamate et al. 2018. It's an app for UPDRS evaluation that is coming soon according to their website uh, for which you have the URL here. Now based on the screenshots that we have managed to find uh, we can tell that this test is actually containing at least finger tapping and then it also have some questionnaires regarding the well-being and we also found some information that they are using a deep neural network for doing the evaluation of the data being collected more than that I sadly don't know about this work but I think it's very interesting then we have also found information that Medopad in collaboration with Tencent is working on assessment of Parkinson disease patients and there are a few YouTube videos that we have found and we have taken screenshots from here revealing that they for example are using pose estimation and that they uh, film the person from the front then doing hand movements then we also have hand pose estimation by Pang et al in 2020 where they are assessing postural trauma of hands, finger tapping, hand movements, and then rapid alternating movements of hands. And what the pose estimation is used for is to identify then the key joints of the hand and then visualize them in three dimensions which is then being used for the scoring so as i have shown you a number of different teams are working on automating and digitalizing updrs but so far none of the methods are mature enough to be used in the clinic or in the home of patients so more work is needed 
So let me now go over and show our approach towards this problem by presenting our experiment setup. So we started out by establishing a standardized uh, experiment setup so that we can get data where we minimize the variation in terms of the background and where we also have then multiple cameras recording at the same time so that we can get rich data now the reason for this is that all our data collection has been done in the clinic of professor tan at the Kaohsiung medical university hospital and we can't keep asking the patients to come back every time uh, we would like to test some new algorithm so we actually need to ensure that we collect data of such a quality that we then can use it for assessing and developing all kinds of algorithms that are needed now here on the left you can see the first iteration of our box for recording hand movements as you can see we have three cameras placed in three from three different directions and then we also have some uh, chess boards here in order to have position references for doing stereo calibration and here we have the box for recording uh, foot movements and we only in this case have two cameras and then we again have chess boards to have position references and then we also have a tablet that we use in order to synchronize the videos and to provide information about the subject so that we don't have any mistakes mixing up different subjects now this was the first version of our box and we have since then made improvements in order to improve the quality of the data that we are collecting and also to make it simpler and more reproducible to build more of these boxes so the major difference you can see here to version 2 is that we changed the position of this front camera so that it's filming more downwards because some subjects uh, were so short that their face actually became visible in the camera and for privacy reasons we don't want that to be the case then we have the current version the third major iteration uh, which we actually took pictures of just uh, yesterday because we realized that we didn't have uh, nice pictures that we wanted to include here and as you can see in this case uh, we have for example added two white markers here in order to uh, guide uh, the subject to place his or her arm between them because we could see that we had uh, unnecessary large variation in the position of the arm then we have also added two oak d cameras uh, which we got as finalists in the open cv ai competition and for the foot box uh, then we have changed design completely to simplify it and also to bring this box closer to the chair and we have now decided to use this uh, standard hospital chair in all cases so that we have a sturdy and safe chair that doesn't change from one location to another 
because we are now planning to deploy this data collection also at the NCKU hospital and also start recording some healthy control subjects in our lab. This as a part of our steps towards uh, collecting data from multiple hospitals so that we can really make this an international collaborative effort and make it as a part of the next uh, update of the UPDRS. I believe that requires international collaboration with many parts involved. Now here you can also see that we have the OKD cameras added and then you can see that we have changed the position of the chess boards and that we have added here a small yellow dot as a marker to help guide the placement of the foot. Now here you can see the view of the back camera in the hand box and as you can notice we are clearly filming the tablet which provides information about the experiment and that is also used to sync the cameras so we both have a timer that will be shown here when it's actually running and then we also have uh, blinking black squares here that are easy to recognize then we have the chess boards so that we have our position markers we have these two markers to guide the placement of the hand now if we instead take a look at it from the two side cameras then we have the left camera here and the right camera and we of course see exactly the same uh, objects in it now here we have the views from the two cameras for the foot box now we are recording no less than seven different motor tests that are part of the UPDRS today and we do them in two different recordings one for the hand tests and one for the foot tests and we always do them in the same order to try to minimize the variation in the data again so for the hand test we start with the sync motion where the subject just rapidly uh, lifts his or her hand three times. This is in order to get a strong signal in the accelerometer that we have attached to the wrist of the subject so that we can synchronize that with what we see in the videos. Because there have been a large number of studies using different types of MARG and accelerometers in order to collect data from uh, Parkinson patients and we want to be able to in our discussion actually relate to such studies and data then after that there's a small break during which uh, a demo video is being shown to the subject and then the finger tapping is performed then again there's a small break and the demo video is being shown for the rest tromor test and then we again have a small break and the video for the hand movement is being shown and then we have a short break and then we show the video demonstration of how to do the postural tromor test and then record the postural tromor data now here in black you have the accelerometer data the magnitude and then we have in different colors marked uh, the time interval during which we have been recording the video data and then the lines here it indicates uh, differences in the starting time point for the videos 
which we have removed by synchronizing them based on using uh, the app in the tablet that we have. Now for the foot experiment um, I'm here showing uh, the previous version and we have again accelerometer data we have we start with a sync motion where the subject is lifting the foot up and down and then we have a, a pause then we show a demo video for the toe tapping and then after that we again have a pause and then we show a demonstration for the rest trail mark and then record it now in the latest update we have actually replaced the sync motion with the leg agility test because now when we change chair then we can do that safely for all subjects and now i would like to show you two of the videos demonstrating the instructions that are given to the subjects. First we will have the video showing the finger tapping test and then after that we will have the video for the leg agility test. The aim is to detect slowness of finger movement. Rotate your right hand outwards so your palm faces left and open your hand as if you were to grip something with your thumb and index finger. Align your arm with the center line of the box. Put your wrist in the middle of the two white dots and open all fingers. Lift your arm about 5 cm straight up. Open your thumb and index finger as widely as possible and close them repeatedly until the tablet says end. Do it as fast as possible. Continue to open your finger as widely and quickly as possible. When finished, rest your arm on the bottom of the box. Start when the tablet says start. The aim is to assess leg agility. Adjust the chair to sit straight with your back resting comfortably against the backrest, your arms on the armrest and your right foot in the box and your left foot on the floor beside the box. Ensure that you sit comfortably with your foot on the right side of the yellow dot and your knee angle near 90 degrees. Raise and stomp your right foot as high and fast as possible until the tablet says end. Do not hit the side or back of the box. Continue to stomp as high and quickly as possible. When finished, place your right foot on the bottom of the box. Start when the tablet says start. Videos demonstrating the other tests that we have included are available at our YouTube channel Nordling Lab. Now I hope that you have a good understanding of the experiment protocol that we are using. Both our experiment setup, what the data that we are collecting look like and also the instructions that we provide to the subjects for recording the UPDRS tests. So let us now take a look at the data that we have collected so far. So we have so far collected data from 18 PD patients and 20 healthy controls and then we also have one subject that has Parkinsonism meaning that that patient doesn't fulfill all the criteria 
for being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, but has some symptoms. Now here on the left you can see the age distribution of our subjects. Here we first have the PD subjects, males in blue and females in red. And then we have our control subjects, males again in blue and females in red. And then we have this one subject with Parkinsonism. Now this is for the hand tests and the only reason for why it differs from the foot tests is that some of the experiments failed meaning that the data recording was not complete. And this is unfortunately unavoidable in particular when doing a clinical data collection and this is something that we need to deal with by then uh, after we have collected all the data do the age matching between the groups um, and then we either have to do the minimum set for which we have all the data or then we can analyze the different tests separately because we also have some variation in the tests. Now we are actively working towards uh, starting our data collection again now when the COVID-19 situation in Taiwan has been uh, improving. We actually had to collect all data collection in May and completely stop it uh, because of the severity of the COVID-19 situation in Taiwan uh, which uh, caused hospitals to uh, ban all non-essential activities. Now let's take a look at some preliminary results. Now good engineering practice dictates that one should always start with the simplest and most established method first and then gradually refine the results by using more advanced and better methods that then provides more accurate measurements. So we have started first by putting a red sticker on the thumb of the subject and the blue one on the index finger because then we can obtain the sticker position by simply doing a color filter and then we can calculate the Euclidean distance between the sticker positions in each frame and then plot it in time. So here we have the Euclidean distance between the fingers measured in pixels and the blue line that's then our data and then to make it easier for the reader to understand the face then we have here in green in the background marked opening and then in reddish closing and then we have also marked the point that we have considered to be the valley where the movement changed from being closing to being opening and then also the peak where it changes from being opening to closing. The reason for this is that as you can see we have some noise here so it's a bit difficult to determine the exact point. And as you can see, for example, here is that the noise lasts for a while, which means that it creates some uncertainty in, uh, for example, uh, the time duration of each of the opening closing movements. So let us now take a look at the finger tapping, toe tapping and hand movement data visualized using this type of graph showing the Euclidean distance between fingers for the finger tapping. 
Now, let us first look at one subject that has been recorded at two different occasions, once in May and another time in August last year. Now, this subject is 66 years old and has Parkinson's disease. And in May, uh, the MDS-UPDRS score was rated for the finger tapping to be 2, while it in August was rated as being 1. Now, what we can see here is that we have quite a bit of variation in the amplitude of these uh, opening and closing cycles for the finger tapping. And similarly, we do have it at the second uh, recording occasion. Now, in these two figures, we have also added the speed, which is calculated based on uh, the Euclidean distance between the fingers. So let us now quantify the differences between these two occasions. So the first time the subject did 40 cycles and the second time 30 cycles the first time there was one freeze, the second time two small freezes, the first time five times of big decrease in amplitude and speed, and the second time four times of a big decrease in the speed. Then in both cases we had 12 decreases in the amplitude, So let us now instead take a look at toe tapping data from this same subject recorded at the same uh, times. So in the case of toe tapping we have placed a marker on the big toe and we are then here showing the Euclidean distance to the rest position. In other words, when the foot is flat along the floor. And uh, as we can see, it again goes up and down with each toe tap. And we can see a fairly small, actually, variation here in the amplitude. We have one, one cycle here that has significantly smaller amplitude. But otherwise, we have a slowly decreasing trend as the subject gets more tired. And the same thing we can see the second time. Now, this uh, subject has an MDS-UPDRS score of one for the toe tapping. And that's uh, understandable because the symptoms are rather mild. So in uh, the first occasion, uh, 22 cycles were recorded and in the second occasion 23 cycles. Uh, we saw a little bit of a broken rhythm the second time and a little bit of slowness the first time. And then we can see a decrease in amplitude uh, 12 times, meaning that the next amplitude is smaller than the previous one. Uh, and this is uh, consistent with having this decreasing trend in the amplitude. While we, for the second recording, can see a decrease eight times, uh, which again is consistent with having this decrease in amplitude. Now, let's take a look at hand movements also from the same two recording uh, dates. So first, um, we have uh, here now measurements of the skin area 
based on using a skin detector. So in this case, we are not tracking any markers, but we are instead just uh, counting the skin number of skin pixels. And then we are normalizing this using a min-max normalization. And then we can again see these cycles as the hand is opened and closed. And similarly for the second uh, recording occasion. And it's difficult to see any clear differences between these two times. So let us take a look at the quantification. So during the first recording 31 cycles were observed and during the second recording 36 cycles. Uh, we see some mild slowing 10 times and a little bit slight slowing 6 times uh, for the second recorder. We have a decrease in the amplitude 12 times and 6 times for the second recording. And uh, our doctor, Pan, he classified this patient as having an MDS UPDRS score for the hand movement of 2. So now you have seen also some data and some preliminary results where we have been checking that we get consistency from one recording time to the next one for the same subject. So let me now talk a little bit about the challenges uh, that we have been facing in this project and that I believe that everyone who tries to actually automate uh, the assessment of UPDRS will be facing. So I already briefly mentioned that it's unclear to us when exactly the movement changes from opening to closing and that we have here highlighted as a feature, a limitation of the 2D tracking where we have taken frames at four different time points. This one here, this one here, this one here and this one here. Now for all these four, uh, the number of pixels after normal or I should say the normalized skin area is actually identical and this makes it really difficult for us to know when the hand is closed using this simple measure of just counting the skin pixels because as you can see in the hand if you compare for example this one here and this one here, then you can see that uh, the fingers are in slightly different position and it looks like the subject is about or already have started opening the hand here. So this is a demonstration that the simplest possible technique is not sufficient for actually getting uh, accurate quantification. Then since a simple count of the number of skin pixels is insufficient, it raises the questions, what should we do then? And we are considering tracking skin features because as you can see in this image, even though uh, the hand is clearly blurred and we have other image artifacts, uh, we are still able to recognize the edge of the nail. We can see that here's some wrinkle and we can also see that here we have the corner of a nail. So it's our belief that we can find enough 
skin features to actually be able to do a 3D rendering in terms of a point cloud of points for the hand that would enable us then to do averaging over these points and provide highly accurate data despite having all issues with image quality that are typical when using video data and we don't think it's possible to reduce these issues uh, to such a degree that they would always be uh, removed since we already have taken very significant steps to standardize our experiment set up we have the green box we ensure that we have the same kind of light every time we are running our cameras at 240 frames per second and we are recording at 720p and now with the new oak d cameras that we have added we will actually be recording rgb in 1080p so uh, since this system should be deployable in the clinic and ideally in the homes of people uh, we have to assume that the image quality will be worse than this and we therefore need to find a method that also works when the image quality is not perfect. We have therefore been working on doing skin feature tracking and that's an essential part of our roadmap forward. More precisely, we have been developing a method that we call deep feature encodings, uh, where we have trained a convolutional uh, autoencoder to actually recognize skin features. Then we also have been doing some work on pose estimation because um, one of the works that I uh, showed in the beginning by Peng et al. Uh, demonstrates hand pose estimation and its application. And then we have made our setup such that we can use stereo vision to actually obtain position in three dimensions since the 2D position is not accurate enough and then the next part will be to actually instead of analyzing one frame at a time look at the time domain that it's a sequence of frames which puts restrictions on how the movement can change and this can be used in particular uh, to deal with motion blur and then of course when moving over to deep learning based methods then a large number of sample becomes essential so data collection continues to be a major part and it's also my belief that that's the most essential part to be able to reach an accuracy that is sufficient for clinical usage and to get the method validated for clinical usage so that it can be adopted as a next revision of the UPDRS, a digitalized UPDRS. Now I would like to highlight our work on the deep feature encodings since uh, my PhD student Jose Chang who have been doing this work gave a talk in the previous workshop so you can watch this talk online already now and I hope that you will find it interesting and enjoy it now with this I would like to thank uh, Dr. Akram Ashiwani, Jose Shang, 
Esteban Roman, Takian Kuo, Ted Ye, Gavin Vivaldi, Jacob Chen, Yishan Lin, Rick Tu, Austin Su, and you for listening. All of these students have been making significant contributions to this work, including our postdoctoral researcher, Dr. Akram Ashiani, and of course, the collaborators that I mentioned in the beginning. Now, I will not be able to take questions today because I think it's more appropriate that you instead ask questions to me during the networking event that takes place on Friday the 10th at 2 p.m. Taipei time. So I look forward to seeing you there and to taking your questions at that time. Thank you very much for listening.